quick Diet Coke, Steffi. Because I'm watching my figure and all that. <laughs> or not. <laughs> all right. Right. right, I can see a few of you guys coming in now. Evening all. Lee Ashby here, Met Across and Speedway Memories. Uh, pleased to have you on this evening. We've got a brilliant guest uh, this evening. Uh, obviously, I've put it out there. Um, I'll just do my thank yous first, and then I'll get into the intro. Um, big thanks for the support to Simon Pardo of uh, White Eagle Finance. They give quality financial advice for pensions, mortgages, investments, and protection. Check the website out at www whiteeaglefinance.co.uk. Big thanks to this legend, Stefan Everts, with his S72 gin and vodka brand. Check out his amazing products out at www.s72gin.com. And also big thanks to uh, Leo Owen of Owen Developments. They specialize in supplying turbochargers to a global customer base covering motorsport, <clears throat> performance aftermarket, and OEM sectors. Check them out on the shop side at www.owenturbos.com and also www.oindevelopments.co.uk. There's a t-shirt there as well. Right then, wish me luck with my intro. I might have to have uh, two or three goes at my 30 second challenge on this. <laughs> another another superb legend on, so obviously there's a few achievements to mention. <laughs> but I'm gonna give it a good bash, but I'd probably be on two at least, I'm sure. So here we go then people, I will get onto this then. Right then, people, this amazing lady has won seven times Italian national championships. She's won the famous Loretta Lynn championship, five US national championships, three women world championships. She was the first woman to win every round of the WMA national championships in 99. She was the first woman rider to star in a video game called Supercross 2000, remember it myself well, and Freakstyle, both by EA Sports. She was the first woman to go with a pro license to race against the men. Told you I wouldn't make it. Second. <laughs> uh, the first woman to compete in Japan as well with a pro championship there. She made history in 2002 by qualifying at the Bud's Creek round of the men's outdoor national championship. She also was the first woman in history to have a motocross helmet, signature helmet, uh, sold worldwide as well for MTR helmets. And also, <laughs> She comp competed in the FIM World Motocross Championship in the MX2 class. I'm going for three. <laughs> she also featured in many famous magazines all across the world, even ones that had nothing to do with the motocross industry. She also ran 211 MX School, and she was the general manager of the FIM Women's World Championship. It's the female goat. It's Miss Steffi Bao. How's it going, Steffi? We're going to bring you in. Hi everyone. How's it going, Steffi? Doing good. I got, there. I got there in the end. Yeah, it took a little longer, but you got there. Yeah, I got there. I got there. Great to have you on. Really appreciate your time, Steffi. Amazing to get you on. Thank you so much, Lee. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. It's definitely an honor for us and a privilege. Really appreciate it. Right, let's get into it. I've got <laughs> loads of pictures on here as well to uh, show you guys as well. Uh, but I'll get into the questions with you, Steffi. How did you actually get into the motocross in Steffi? And what was your earliest memory of the sport? And what bike did you first have? Yes. So I started to go into motocross because my mom and dad, they were big fan of the sport. They, I was born in Italy, so I'm Italian yeah. and American now too, but, you know, Italian yeah, by, enough, by yeah. birth. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
Yes, so they were fan of the sport. They used to go watching the World Championship round when it was coming to Italy. They brought me to watch the round since I was a little baby, <laughs> you know. Yeah, nice. So it kind of yeah. like uh, embedded in me, you know, the smells yeah. and the sound of our fantastic sport. Mm-hmm. And uh, then uh, my dad had a motorcycle and he was doing mostly like trail riding when uh, on Sunday, he, my mom and dad owned a butcher shop. So they were busy throughout the whole week. But that Sunday, dad liked to go out, you know, and have fun, but I never competed, just trail riding, you know, with a couple of okay. friends. And yep. I was super happy to see him every time he was coming back home. I can hear it, you know, from far away, <laughs> him arriving home, like all full of mud, you know, like with a big <laughs> smile on the face and kind of like him got impressed in, into me. So yeah. at four years old, I asked them, hey, I, I would like to have a motorcycle like like dad. And they bought me one instead of buying, you know, like a toy one. You know, like uh, they yeah. ended up uh, doing uh, like a, a, a peewee. And uh, back then in Italy, we had the Ital Jets. So very yeah. small motorcycle. And yeah. uh, it's a brand that they actually resuscitated recently. But, you know, it was out of the of the frame for a, for a little while. But back then it was the, the bike to have for little kids. And uh, I started like that. And I started in the field, in the cornfield in front of my house. Then uh, at one point, my dad in one of his uh, uh, trail ride um, adventures came across a little track where he saw parents with other kids uh, uh, riding there. And it was crazy. He came home and said, get dressed. We're going to go there. They didn't know the kids were like getting together and ride. So we go there and I still remember, you know, it was me following my dad in the fields, you know, at four yeah. you know, to go over there. <laughs> yeah. And amazing. And uh, the we got there and in one hour time, I was beating all the, the little kids there. So the parents start saying, where you guys came from? And my dad, from the field, we live three miles that way. And then it kind of like all started like that. And we started to go the first race and yeah, rest is history. <laughs> Amazing. I, I mentioned uh, before we come on uh, the other day that we were actually the same age and stuff and mm-hmm. both born in February. I actually uh, started on an Italajet as well that my dad made me. So it sounds about right error and everything. Awesome. Really cool. yeah. yeah. He made me a little speedway disc in the back as well, in the back wheel, which looked pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. I've got everyone, loads of people coming online saying uh, good evening, Steffi. Um, they're all coming on here that evening. Steffi and Lee, Tim Eastman, he's a schoolboy champion in the UK as well. How are you doing, Tim? Evening all. Right. Uh, next questions I've got for you. Um, what riders did you look up to and idolize when you were young then, Steffi? And did you get to race any of them guys or girls? Okay, so yes. Um, when I was a little girl, I was always fascinated by America. So much so that at six years old, uh, at six, I look at my mom and dad in the eyes and I said, one day I will go to the United States of America and I will become a champion there. Of wow. course, you know, at six, my parents are like, yes, <laughs> yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah, you of know. course you will, yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the next race first and then we'll figure it out. But hey, you know, I ended up doing it. Wow. So that was cool. So cool. because my family was into the sport, you know, we have all of these magazines you know around in the in the house and I remember growing up one of the person the writer that I was looking up was Ricky Johnson you know like uh, he was like in America he was doing crazy stuff you know like when I was very little kid and winning tons of title and he was like one that I was really like looking up for too and then uh, Jean-Michel Bale because you know it's an european and went there so it kind of like fed my desire to do yeah. something similar and as far as women rider you know when i got a little bit older like in my teenage years i learned of mercedes gonzalez and she was the first american superstar uh, female rider and i ended up actually now i'm a very good friend with her and oh, i ended nice. up uh, coming to the united states my first time when i was 14 and uh, there was this event it was in in, in a, a women uh, race where where she was still you know like a queen of the sport and yeah. I beat her and I won the race wow. and for me it was like seeing my idol and racing with and then we'll be able you know like to win the competition and I learned so, so much from her and like I said we are friends now and as far as the the guys I didn't get to compete with them you know yeah. like but I'm so happy that there is mutual respect you know like I talk yeah. to RJ you know on the phone if we need to and uh, he cool? yeah he cool? 
so you know like it's it's very cool like motocross it's uh, yeah. probably one of the sport that lets you do that to be able to have a possibility to actually talk to your idols you know like uh, like you do lee you know that you're like talking with a bunch that. of yeah, people yeah. yeah amazing <laughs> yeah for sure well, that must have been very surreal for you then to actually look up to him and then be on the line and then actually beating them as well that's pretty cool isn't it? That was cool. That was cool. Of course, you know, when you're younger, you're cocky and it comes with a sport and it comes <laughs> yeah. with a territory. You know, it's it just happens yeah. like that. So, yeah. like, my behavior probably back then were uh, not as nice as it is right now. <laughs> but again, as a professional rider, if you're not cocky and you don't think you are mm. the best in the world, you're never going to win. So, that's your mentality. That's what you have to to think. And so, do. I gather you, you gather you must have had a lot of self belief and confidence. Obviously, did you used to put that out there as well? Then as well, did you? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. motocross as a, as a whole, I think it is a sport that builds confidence. You know, like that you can transfer this in everyday life. You know, but uh, you have to have that belief in yourself deep inside because it's such a hard sport, and you have to go through so much, so many sacrifices that if you don't believe in yourself, there is no way that you can be successful. So yes, I had that, and I guess it served me well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right, here's my man, Tim Heesman from the UK. He's a schoolboy champion, multi-champion in the UK. He just put, how many hours a day did you spend training physically and not bike time, just the fitness time? Yes. So I'm going to tell you, a run through my daily schedule when I was yeah. a professional uh, racer here in the US. Yep. Um, so I was pretty much waking up in the morning, like 7, 7.30, having my breakfast. And then okay. the first part, the first couple hours of the morning was either running go for a run okay. like um, okay. i don't know a 10k run or okay. um mountain biking or swimming you know any any yeah. one of those they will uh, include about a couple hours of training like that then you go to the track and then there there is like the the motos and whatnot and then when you come back home you do it again you do like either 20 30k on a mountain bike or 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 a cycling cycling as a whole or swimming depending also on the injuries like because you know we do have a lot of injuries so yes. we need to adapt swimming yeah. sometimes is swimming easier is good, yeah. you know? yeah. so you kind of like watch it like that but um yeah. it was like a whole day full-time job you know to be able mm. to be successful and and uh, yeah, lots of work early morning, then the motos during the day, and then uh, closing out the day. We kind of like cool down, but still like uh, aerobic training toward the end yeah. of the day and wake up and do it all over again. Is it quite hard to get the fine line between rest and the, and the fitness? It's, it's very difficult. You can sometimes overtrain, can't you? It is. And uh, mm. for, for an athlete, it's incredibly important to always, always look at your body because it's mm. you. You know, so you know what works for you. So just uh, pay attention. Your body will tell you when it's time to rest. And even though you have the desire to keep going, to keep grinding, because motocross athletes are like that, <laughs> you know, like maybe shift down a gear <laughs> every once yeah. in a while and say, okay, yeah. maybe I need to rest a little bit more. But absolutely, yeah. resting is incredibly important. And uh, the, the few of, of pro riders, they are lucky enough that they can afford to have a big professional trainer they will be yeah. you know like uh, uh guided by that and but if you are aiming to become you know a professional rider and you don't have the possibility to hire a pro, a pro trainer just listen to your body that's the best advice i can give uh, what do you think about i've noticed obviously a lot of sports these days in the modern era they have like mental coaches and things like that as well what do you think about all that absolutely Mm. That is incredibly important too. Mm. Again, it, it all depends on the, the level that you are in into the sport. You know, higher is the the level, more investment for uh, people around you are part of the deal. More you have to be on top of everything and uh, mental health. It's incredibly important and. Um, it's, you know, like we feed as rider, we feed on the energy of the crowds, of the race itself and whatnot, right? So mm. if for some reason you have a bad race, you still have to be very strong mentally and kind of like mm. compartmentalize and say, okay, that's just a bad race, right? And, uh, but if it happens for multiple races, then because we tend to be cocky, then you start questioning. <laughs> it's like, what is going on? You know, like, and in, uh, um, melt and training you know like and again professional that can help you through that it's incredibly important and mm. actually we are seeing nowadays i think uh, in one of the last supercross it was said that they actually can roxon as hire mm. a, a mental trainer 
because of this you know like yeah. it's important to be you know straight yeah. in the head you know as much as you can yeah it was very cool last night when i spoke to roger about that and he, we sort of touched on it and he was sort of saying about these top top guys i had doubts ricky carmichael's and things like that talking about bubba's too f fast and practice and the, the mind games and stuff it's very interesting to get mm -hmm. into that. very interesting <laughs> Right. Uh, who would you say has been your closest rivals over your career? And who did you enjoy racing with the most in your career? Um, let's see. <laughs> so, like, uh, the majority of my career, you know, when I, I became really successful, it happened in the United States, you know. So, I can relate to, to rival in the United States. So, yeah. one of, as a female rider, probably the one that was, uh, like, the the competitor that we were going neck to neck a lot was Jessica Patterson yeah, and uh, we we did lots and lots of good battles you know but <laughs> I also like a lot as a friend because we can, became friend a Kiwi which is um, actually no a Kiwi Aussie um, like uh, Tanya Satchwell she was uh, coming over and had the same dream as me, you know, but I ended up beating her all the time. But we became very good friends. And in fact, when we talk, it's like, dang, Steffi, you know, <laughs> every time I was just going to have to do second. You know? Yeah, someone's got you, Steffi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Um, someone's just put, uh, who was the first manufacturer sponsor? And when was this that you got? Quite an interesting one. Okay, so I got a sponsorship, uh, manufacturer sponsorship when I was back in uh, in Europe, and that happened with Yama in Italy and uh, Kawasaki Italy. Um, then when I moved to the United States, my last year in uh, in uh, in Europe was with Kawasaki, so I kind of transferred directly with Kawasaki in the U.S. through the Team Green efforts back there. So I worked with Kawasaki, and then uh, I started to establish myself as a a a, a good rider in the US and I was able to have the first ride, professional ride with Honda actually and I was the first woman in the history of the sport to do that and it was not under the tent, yeah. <laughs> really in exile with the guys because back in the days it was still a little bit of unfortunately stigma about women you know coming into the sport but they give me the full on support so it would be kind of like a, now compared to a satellite team that has the full support, but they run a, on a different tent. So yeah. it, it can be compared with that. So Honda definitely is my heart. Is the, the brand that they are looked up because back in the days, RJ and and mm. JMB, they were on Hondas. And uh, yeah, and uh, was my dream. And I was able to achieve it. Amazing. Uh, I did have, what was your favorite race bike during your racing career? I'm not sure if that was the Honda or... It was the Honda. Like I mm. loved my 2002 Honda. Was uh, still on yeah. the 125s uh, mm -hmm. um, moments, you know, like because in America the two, the four stroke started kind of like in 2004, and uh, in 2002 was my second title in the, in in uh, in the women division. And when I also qualify at Bud's Creek, and I was also doing Supercross back then, and that bike was ripping, you know, and uh, I I really liked that that bike and. Uh, yeah. Probably one of, one of the best that uh, I ever ridden. If we go back in time, I also really like the Yamas in uh, 1997. So yeah. back in the day, still are talking about 125 bikes two -stroke, and yeah, uh, yeah two stroke. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, so. Very nice. Right, we'll get this out this way, Steffi, because uh, this always comes up on these interviews. Oh, there he is. <laughs> right, so you've got Adam Pryor. He's put, can you give a big shout out to Gav Richmond, please? All right. Hey, Gav Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we always come on. I used to race with these guys and we always get a shout out to Gav Richmond, all these uh, top famous uh, sports stars. So there awesome. you go, Gav. There you go, Gav. Steffi Bow is giving you a shout out. There you go. Hey, Gav. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, next one I got is what uh, your, was your favorite race number? I know uh, the name uh, numbers changed and stuff. Uh, obviously, I see you did your uh, motocross school with the 211. Was that? Yes. Was there a reason for that? Was there a favorite number you preferred or? Yeah, okay. So I kind of like made a brand out of the 211 number because the 211 number was given to me when I got the professional license with AMA. Okay. So as as a first time 
person getting the license, you know, they yeah. cannot assign you a number. It's not mm -hmm. that you can pick it. Yeah. And uh, they assign me the number 211 and I decided to make a brand out of it. And uh, it was very cool. Yes, it's a three digit number. Some people say, ah, oh, three digits are, you know, for the one in the back of the pack, whatever, you know, like I really like that number. Okay. And uh, I made, uh, I made them. Um, like I said, branding out of it. I remember that in the 2000, from 2000 to 2003, uh, yeah. at the AMA races, so they had the, the trucks with the, the, you can buy the t-shirts, you know, with mm -hmm. the riders. And I had the 211 t-shirt there. So it was very cool, very nice. you know, to see very the, nice. you can get the Steffi Bau t-shirt alongside the Ricky Carmichael's or Grand Langstone or whatever back then, you know, yeah, they were very racing. Nice. Love them. Yeah, love them ones. Uh, did you have any favorite race gear that you wore over the years that you uh, really liked? All right. So mm. here, it's it's interesting territory. So let me explain mm. it like this. Yep. When I was in Europe, I yep. embraced, of course, the Italian brand, the UFO. You yeah. know, like they were back in the day, they were very, very big and they helped mm -hmm. so many people. And uh, Vito, the, the guy they owned, the company was very passionate about the sport. It really, really wanted to help, uh, uh, to help out. So it was kind of like a, a no brainer. I'm Italian, you know, like let's work with them. And, and it was mm -hmm. good. I brought UFO in the USA when I first came to the USA and that was incredibly interesting because the brand was fairly unknown and I was yeah. getting all of this attention so for yeah. me it was like uh, happy to bring a little bit of Italy with me in this new yeah. adventure so I really love the relationship with them but of course then in in the United States territory UFO was not really a big brand and even though I help you know establish or or put the name on the map oh, yeah, yeah. then it, you kind of like had to go a little bit with the American brands so I work with Answer gear back then. I work with Thor gear. I never work with Fox. So I think the main, the, the two brands that I work with uh, the most was, was Thor and uh, Answer when I was here in the US. Very nice. We've got uh, Mark Taylor's just come on, I think, for his daughter. He's just asked, uh, can you please say hi to yes. Lottie Taylor? Hashtag hi. 52. Yes. Hi, Lottie. I follow you. So I know. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Lottie. And there you go, Mark Taylor. So that's cool. And mm -hmm. Steffi follows you as well. Can't get much better than that. There you go. Mm -hmm. Did you have any uh, superstitions, uh, Steffi, when you were racing? Did you have any weird superstitions or? Uh, <laughs> okay. So that's also is a very interesting. So I have two aspects yep. on that. So okay. When I was little, you know, like so growing yeah. up as a little girl coming mm -hmm. from Italy and if Italian family, I remember that my grandma made this little pouch with a little bit of garlic and the red pepper, like chili pepper, and okay. wanted, wanted me to put, to put it in, in the side of my pants every, every time I was racing. Because okay. From my mom and, and my grandma point of view as Italian, it kind of like was kind of like a, a, a thing that you use to put away, you know, bad bad spirits or bad, you okay. know, like negative yeah, energy. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up by doing that and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. When I came over and I became like more like myself and, you know, not mm. with the support of the family, I mm. dropped that, that thing. Okay. And but I do remember that I had a, a, a fan that made this super cool short for me that was like a hand and uh, spray painted with my design and whatnot and they gave yeah. it to me and for some reason i started wearing that as a, my undershirt, undershirt yeah. and i just liked it so every time i was racing i was having that shirt and it came at the end of my career was barely together because you know <laughs> yeah for the long time years. but i don't know if it was more like superstitious or if it was more like um something that meant something like uh, coming yeah. to a new country somebody did that for me and uh, i just embraced it and um, yeah so that was my thing brilliant did they did the person that actually make uh, make it for you did they know that you always wore it no they didn't know that i was always no, wore it for sure no yeah, no yeah. they just made it and wow. gave it to me you know but i never met the person afterwards you know like yeah. uh, i because, you know, with racing, you know, you meet so many people and sometimes, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. roads goes in different direction. But I'm sure and I hope that they were happy to see that uh, sometimes during, 
you know, you have those funny pictures when you do very hot races as soon as they you okay. arrive, <laughs> arrive to take everything <laughs> else. So there were some pictures with that short, uh, with me and that short just after the finish line. So hopefully they got to experience that and they were happy. Hopefully, they were hopefully wearing it. They, yeah, hopefully they see that. Um, where did you ride uh, when you was a youth rider? You mentioned about in Italy. Uh, what sort of experiences did you have as a youth then? And did was you successful straight away as a youth? Yeah, so uh, in Italy, when I started racing, I started racing at six years old, you know, so when you are little like that, you know, like there is no really difference between boys and girls, you know, like you're there having fun. And the very first race I did in my life, I finished third. And then after that, that year, it was 1983, you know, so back in the days, I, I won every race I entered. So that kind of like spearheaded, you know, for my parents also, like getting excited and me, you know, having the little trophy every weekend, you know, like, so we continue. So I had a very success, successful mini cycle career. Mm -hmm. I, in one year in uh, 1986, um, there was Dave Stribus, the one that the world championship with the Kajiva bike yeah. and uh, the Castiglioni family, they owned the Kajiva brand back then. They were in Varese, so kind of closer with the, uh, the area where I was uh, born, um, decided to make a replica bike for me. So the bike was identical of Kevin's bike, the 1986 World Championship bike. It was one model. They made it for me uh, only. And uh, I ended up winning 18 out of 20 races I competed in that year. Yeah. So it was very cool. You know, like, I, like again, you know, I had a, a, a very nice career. And uh, when I started eating the teenagers, teenage year then you know of course things start to change you yeah. know and uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a little bit of a different experience i mean yeah. for me the most difficult part i think it was the fact that they being the only girl you know back mm -hmm. then to to compete it was it was hard in 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 a few aspects because you feel a little bit isolated mm -hmm. you know and and of course when you win a lot you're also like that too because nobody likes you right yeah uh, on top of it you know also being a female you know it, mm -hmm. it, it was a little bit difficult but um you know, my dream, like I said, I always stick with it. You know, I wanted to come to America and I'll be successful here. So I was able to compartmentalize, you know, what was, was happening to me. And um, I just stick with my dream and, and continue to grow. So uh, in Europe, when I won a title with... Um, the Italian title with the men when I was 17 yeah. years old. Yeah. And uh, that was a, was fairly impressive. I believe it has not been done since, still from a, from a female. Yeah. And uh, I, I love that, you know, like, uh, and then when I, that was still kind of sort of like more the amateur level, like the national yeah. level, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, like by an like amateur, Italy, yeah. you know, level things. When I turned pro, I have to say there was a big difference and I turned pro in, in Europe and then also in the United States. Uh, I came over, you know, and I, I became pro after the first season I was here. Um, I guess there is a big difference when you start to get to that level because uh, when you jump from uh, the top amateur to the pro, mm -hmm. it's a whole different world. Like in the top anim am amateur, I was still seeing a lot of like guys they want to like uh, to make their goal to take me down instead of like winning the race yeah. you yeah. know whereas in the pro it completely changed like uh, i was seen by all the other athletes like i'm there with a the helmet on doing the same thing that they were doing so i was just another rider at the gate with them and that made me feel very good because in the end, it's supposed to be like this, you know, like we are yeah. all there having fun together and it should not be different if it is a woman or a, or a boy, you know, like at, at the gate. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I did have a question for this and Mark's just come up with it as well. Um, what advice would you give to a young girl trying to make her way in the women's motocross? Well, uh, a few. <laughs> like, yeah. let's, let's start saying like... Uh, Never give up is the first one. You're going to have a lot of doors closed in front of you because even though society is getting better, but there are still mm -hmm. a lot of people out there that they're going to say that uh, girls don't belong in the sport. So mm -hmm. don't listen. Keep going with your passion because it's whatever ticks in your heart is what you should follow in your life. So that's for number one thing. Then work extremely hard. Nothing comes easy. There is no shortcuts. It doesn't mm -hmm. happen. It doesn't happen in motocross and it doesn't happen in life either. So work hard, work hard, 
put it 100%, if this is what you want to do, that needs to be your mission. Every day you have to do something for that. But please don't forget education. That is the most important thing in life. Don't give do bad at school because you're thinking about writing. You know, remember this, the smartest writer that has the most amount of success is the writer that can also handle, you know, the contract negotiation, interviews, and that comes from your education at school. Yeah. So important, always mm -hmm. go to school and get your diploma. I, it's funny, I have a diploma in accounting because my wow. mom and dad wanted me to before coming to America to have at least a diploma. And uh, mm -hmm. it was hard to mm -hmm. do school and, and, and racing at the level that I was doing it, but I pull it off and I'm grateful because now I run companies. I haven't understand, I, I don't do the accounting part of it. <laughs> I hire accountants for that, but you know, like I have a business un understanding and, uh, and that has helped me after racing to do what I'm doing now. Very interesting. Uh, oh, this is an interesting one as well. Uh, um, someone's put uh, Mick Nurse here. He's put, hiya, uh, how was your knowledge of setting up your bikes up and the mechanical know-how? Was that something that you got into? Absolutely. I was able to yeah. turn down a, 120, a 125 and change the yeah. top end. No problem. Even when yeah. I moved to four stroke that uh, I was gaining, uh, I only did a 2004 and 2005 in four stroke because then I had my accident that stopped my career. But yeah. even then I learned how to turn down completely a four stroke and do revolving. And wow. I think this is incredibly important. I was doing it. I did it not because I needed to do it because I had my mechanics doing it. But you need mm -hmm. to understand your bike. It's the same concept before about understanding your body. If you, if you know exactly how the machine works, including yeah. suspension, motor, reaction, gearing, you know, you name it. If you know because you have an understanding of that, then you can go to your mechanic and say, hey, I think I need this. Hey, I think I might need a couple of clicks here. So it's not like putting everything on the end of somebody that is outside. They have their own perception by watching you and therefore they can give you advice, but they're not you on the motorcycle. So, yeah. you know, like it's, you need to know it. And uh, this came when I was a little girl, six years old. My dad put me there, changing the filter, you know, cleaning the wow. motorcycle just when I was, you know, like uh, that little. And uh, it, it grew and make me understand, you know, what's all behind and how they all think work. And then you feel it when you ride it because you have an understanding. So, yes, I did that. I think that was incredibly important. And even nowadays, I feel that uh, a lot of riders, they have that knowledge, are able to communicate it with their team better. Brilliant. Uh, what are you uh, doing now, Steffi? I know that you are working in the gaming industry with uh, Init Esports as a director. I'm sure you're doing it with your sister and someone else yes. as well, isn't it? Yes, yes. Can you so, tell us so, all about that? Absolutely. So, yep. Uh, for the people that play video games, maybe this is not a, a news, but for the one that they don't, I'm going to tell you that the video game sector has exploded incredibly since COVID because yeah. everybody's at home. And uh, motorsport as a whole started to dip their feet into, into this uh, segment by doing Formula One games, you know, and tournament. And uh, uh, Dorna with MotoGP started to do that last year. And uh, I saw that there was nothing going on for off-road. So I'm like, hmm, wait a second, you know. And then I noticed, like, I have a niece that she was spending, like, three, four hours a day watching people playing video games yeah, you know like think, mm, yeah. what is this mm. what is this segment so you know i decided to put together a, a company uh, with my sister that she comes from um, uh, MotoGP world. She has worked in MotoGP. Of course, she followed me my whole entire career. She's my younger sister yeah. uh, and knows motocross and whatnot. She also works right now with Tony Cairoli. And uh, and then, you know, but also as working in MotoGP and, and, and whatnot. And then Claire Ritchie, that uh, she is uh, uh, UK, she's from London, and she comes from Formula One. Yeah. So three women that uh, have had success in motorsports, you know, mm -hmm. which are male-dominated sports, we decide to do the same and put together a company to do this in gaming. So what we achieved so far, the company is fairly new. We started in 2019. Um, we achieved something that I, I think is fairly cool, which mm -hmm. is uh, we are the official promoter 
for all AMA eSport tournaments. So what that means is that in this year, we're going to start the tournaments and everybody from around the world can compete in those tournaments. And if you win the title, you're going to have a number one AMA plat and wow. be awarded alongside the Ken Roxon or the Eli Tomac, you know, of the of, of the sports. And I think that's yeah. pretty cool. And for me, cool, yeah. it's a way to figure it out how we can get more people into our sports because mm -hmm. our sport is expensive. We all know. And not everybody, you know, especially if they come from a minority group or whatnot, had the possibility, financial possibility to get involved right away. Yeah. You know, but gaming gives you that option, you know, like mm -hmm. because you can buy a game and, and a console and with, you know, I don't know, 150 pounds, you know, like you're set to go. Yeah. And then, you know, we can get these people to get become so much passionate of the sport and then turning them into consumer of the industry. And our goal is to put as a prices beside a price pool in money, we, we are thinking to put motorcycles or uh, schools uh, and so on and so forth to be able to grow the sport you know, from a grassroots level by using gaming, that it's something that uh, many, many people are doing right now. Yeah, youngsters is a good way to get to the youngsters for sure, isn't it? Yeah. Is it going all well? Is it going well? Yeah, it's going good. Like, uh, we started a company, like I said, in 2019, and uh, the goal was to do in 2020 the, the immediately the championship. But we needed to put a stop on that because the games they are on the market right now they are not they were not at, at the same level of the car games, yeah. meaning like uh, the the audience was not engaged enough because it was the game were always like first person point of view. So yeah. if you were gonna watch it, you were just seeing me, you know, yeah. behind the end bar, and that's it. Whereas mm -hmm. the car game, they were a little bit more evolved because you get the same experience of uh, watching it on TV. So mm -hmm. kind of like the overall view of the track, you know, and, and yeah. kind of like a, a real product, TV production, right? So mm -hmm. now we are getting to that level. So in 2021, we're going to do the game, the, the championship uh, with, uh, with the two wheels. Although we did this event, which I thought that was very cool in, to pivot because we were waiting for the games, which mm -hmm. is called Race Me. And this event, uh, I call up a uh, uh, superstar athlete from different sports. Okay, so we had uh, Hope Solo from soccer. We got uh, uh, Aerial Power from WNBA. Oksana Master, she's a, a four-time gold medalist Paralympian. We got different girls, uh, super successful in different sports, and we put them in a simulator, right? Wow. And, and play, you know, a car game. It was a NASCAR game. And to oh, yeah. talk top of that off we got nascar drivers to become coaches to these girls you oh. know so they can learn you know how to play because even though they are incredibly good athletes on their sports mm -hmm. putting them you know on doing a, a nascar race car you know even on a simulator was like okay where do i start right but it was incredibly good to see the evolution you know, like how quick they picked it up. Also the competitiveness, because you put a stream athlete, you know, top athlete together, there is going to be competitiveness. Funny, because some of them, you know, like were going in different places, but also incredibly important because we were able to put a, a very big light onto diversity and inclusion and show that all together we can really do something, something kind of cool. So if you want to watch this, it's still online. So if you are curious. Yeah, we'll have to definitely check that out. That sounds yeah. really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Right, I've got some nice comments coming in now, Steffi, as well. I've got Craig here from Wales in the UK. He's put, what a down-to-earth woman. Great enthusiasm. Tim Thank followed you. that. Well said, Craig. I was just thinking that. Uh, Mix just put, as a sportswoman, was there any sports that you would have loved to have done if it was not motocross? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I have to say, I put my feet into downhill mountain biking. Okay, you know, yeah. uh, this was back in 1997. Mm -hmm. So I was racing motorcycle motocross and then I got this opportunity to race for the Italian Olympia team is a bicycle brand. And they put me in and uh, they just and I was just doing it because I wanted to try. Right. So yeah. I, I did a second and a third in the Italian championship. And because wow. I did second and third in the Italian championship, Italy decided to put me in, in the team for the World Championship. Wow. The World Championship race was th my third downhill mountain bike race ever. <laughs> and I, I finished 15th. So yeah. that, 
that was was good although of course yeah, very good as cocky as I was back then, I was like, hey, I'm going to win this. Come on now. <laughs> uh, but 15, you know, like in high sight, I think it was incredibly good. And then again, you know, like back in the day, there was this woman. Uh, her name is Giovanna Bonazzi. That was Italian. Superstar. She won a lot of world championship. And we are incredibly good friends now. She came over wow. in America um, last year and we went to ride mountain biking together and, and we're not so. Bonta Mike was one thing I tried. Then another thing that I did try still on on kind of like in the same umbrella, if you wish, uh, street bike racing, like road racing. So mm -hmm. I, I participated, that was 1996, actually the year before. And a team in Italy got me the opportunity to race the back then called Sport Production uh, mm -hmm. Championship, the Italian Championship. And uh, I won a couple of races in the women class and uh, for me it was incredibly cool especially when it was raining because mm -hmm. i was completely comfortable on this like coming from yeah, motocross yeah. Right? Yeah. so everybody was like oh my god this is supposed to be difficult <laughs> you know <and> I, <laughs> yeah you're smashing it <laughs> <laughs> and then i did a couple of races with the with the boys and the best one with the boys was i got a fourth overall but wow. road racing for me yeah. back then it was like cool but no enough action. I like it, you know, like the smashing yeah. against people, you know, in motocross and, <laughs> and all of that. So other than that, I don't know if I really had any passion to do other sports. I mean, mm. maybe car sports. Uh, I don't know. And but still motorsport. I think my heart is uh, into the racing and yeah, the two wheels and that, I think. <laughs> Another nice comment here from James. He's put, uh, love you, Steffi. What you, what you do and what you have done, you're a legend of whom your passion is infectious. Very Thank nice. you. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, what was your favorite track, Steffi? Firstly, as a youth rider, did you have a favorite track? And then, like, obviously, in America and Europe as well, did you have some favorite tracks that you liked? Yeah, so, so as a youth rider, there is a, the, my favorite track was the track very close to home because... Mm -hmm. uh, um, I was able to go there, my dad after work, you know, in the summer when it was still a little bit light out, was able to bring me there and and, and race. And there was Italian championship ran there. So it, it was very good. And I've actually something I want to share, like a couple of years ago, I was in Italy and Team Geyser won uh, the, the world championship. And uh, uh, they were doing a, a, an event there at that particular track because it's very close to the Garibaldi headquarter for uh, the H HRC uh, team. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I, I just heard that there was this going on. So I just showed up. Oh my God! Everybody was rolling around me, Nissan and team, and, <laughs> and it was like, yes, it was incredible and goosebumps. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was good because with all of these people, they saw me grow up there, you yeah. know, like and having my career starting there, and and so that's definitely one day is really dear to me. Although, yeah. like a very cool cool tracks in Italy there, there have been a lot and, and over in, in Europe even like the, the race track where I, I participated to be the first woman in the history of our sport to race a, a round of the MX2 that yeah. was in Castiglione del Lago so it was one, yeah. a very nice track. So usually I like a lot of the track that there are like a elevation with elevation change, mm. you know, natural terrain like that. Yeah. Um, in the US, um, a few favorite again, Bats Creek because it was the one that I was able to qualify yeah. for the for the for the show, you know, in uh, in twenty in two thousand and two, and then Red Bud is. I mean, who doesn't like Red Bud, for yeah, instance? Yeah, that's great. That's amazing, and uh, yeah. yeah, maybe even Glen Ellen, you know, like because of the elevation. Shade. Also, the atmosphere of California is always something like, oh, this is pretty cool. Brilliant. I got uh, Mick also said, uh, I am a big Kajiva lover and I have, uh, I had three. How did it feel when you got to ride an Italian bike as an Italian? Well, it was a. Uh, Incredibly cool, but I was little, I was 11 years old. So yeah. at that time, I didn't appreciate as much as I appreciate now. You know? yeah. But uh, for me, the thing that was super cool is like that uh, I had the replica motorcycle of motorcycle that I was seeing in the magazine of Kevin. So mm -hmm. that was the thing that I felt me, I felt incredibly good for me that was italian or not i didn't really think about it back then but again yeah. now now in high sight i'm incredibly yeah. happy that a company back in the days that big took a chance on a little girl and said yes you know we're gonna help you and uh, went 
beyond, you know, like everything and create a model. That's the only one that ever existed, by the way. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I don't have it because oh, sure. <laughs> unfortunately, I don't because unfortunately, back in the days, you know, my mom and dad, we come with, we, we are a very, very humble family. So to be able to continue races was all like you need to sell the year before bike to <laughs> yeah, get a new yeah, bike. Yeah. Everybody yeah. relates to that. So, yeah. I, I, I don't have that bike, but I have a picture of it, <laughs> and, that's uh, and that's it. But, yes, it's uh, definitely a cool thing. Did you uh, get to keep any of your bikes? Have you got any bikes still now? Or? No, unfortunately, no. I know that you asked this to Roger yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't. I know that there are a few hanging, I mean, still circulating, because uh, yeah. a couple of years ago, I got somebody that sent me a picture and say, this is the bike that you won the title with. And wow. I was like, uh, okay. And then, you know, like he showed me the proof, like the VIN number. And I remember, you oh, know, all right. of that stuff. But what can I do? You know, I, I don't know if I can go to a person and say, hey, can I have it back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, no. But one thing that I keep is like uh, when uh, I won the title for, uh, for Honda, the, uh, they gave me a pit bike, you know, an XR50 oh, okay. pit bike as a, as yeah. a gift. And that bike was like um, all the color, the plastic and the graphic was like exactly identical to my race bike. So I do have that. So it's, I guess it's better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've got, uh, what was your, if you had to pick um, your most memorable race, is there one that sticks in your mind still today that? Um, let's think back. Um, there are a lot of races that can stick in the mind, depends on, on what has happened, you know, like yeah. I have to say that uh, probably that's not a race, totally race because I didn't make it into the main, but the yeah. first time that I walked into Hanheim Stadium uh -huh, and I was so, going yeah. to do Supercross, I remember on the Thursday on press day, I walked the track and on press day, probably a lot of you know, you know, the track is not totally form, you know, like you have only a few of the jumps and whatnot. And I walked on the face of the first triple and I'm like, this weekend I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> the first triple. <laughs> because when the one to guys tell me, oh, I tell yeah. you, they are not easy. <laughs> faint hearted, not for the faint hearted. No, not at all. So that was something that definitely was uh, interesting. And I remember when um, I was uh, uh, in the in the in the practice, and then in the time practice, you know, the level in Supercross is like out of this world. And for me, you know, growing up doing motocross my entire life, I was yeah. confident and, mm -hmm. and comfortable to on that type of approach, you know, but in Supercross, it's, to, it's like as intensity times 10, you know, compared, yeah, yeah. compared to motocross. And I remember that you kind of like, in a way, you have to do the jumps. You don't even have the time to question, you know, yeah. hey, maybe I'll double instead of triple. You can't because otherwise people jump on you. you yeah. know what I mean? Just so it's it. kind of, it's just like that, you know, and I learned so much. And then, of course, like all the other races I did, you know, I learned, I learned much more. For my Supercross experience, um, the race that stick out the most is actually Daytona because yeah. Daytona is very rough, but it's a little bit more closer to motocross than <laughs> any other Supercross. And I almost made it in for one spot that didn't qualify in Daytona. And that was the one that, like, uh, you know, because of Daytona and everything, it was like, ah, but uh, yeah, and yeah. and then I guess you know mostly the races are the one that I had a, a very good success. I remember like the second title that uh, I won in the United States was that uh, at the end of it was a Steel City Raceway. That was the the last last event. Yeah. It felt completely like kind of like yeah. you cross the finish yeah. line. Say, I did it. I did it again. You know, it's kind of like. Whew. All the hard work, you know, like uh, kind of like goes out of you. You deflate a little bit, and you feel very proud of your of yourself. Big relief. Uh, I've got a nice one here from Kaz Wright. I remember she raced in the UK as well. She's put great to hear another girl with such a great passion for motocross. In the seventies, it was very different for girls. Great interview, Steffi. Yeah, I know. We have come a long way. There is still a long way to go for women in the sport, but we have come a long way. And I always say, say to everybody, I'm here for any girls that want any, any advice. I'm here to help because I think that united, we can do much, much better than just going at it by ourselves. Awesome. 
Um, I remember you being the first woman to be in uh, the video game, uh, yes. Supercross 2000. I actually got it. Yeah, so that was How like... How cool was that? That was super cool. You know, like right. I, I was... 2000 was my first year with my professional license. The moment where I walked into uh, the stadium in AM, you know, and I said I was mm-hmm. going to die. So having, <laughs> having a, a video game company such as ES Sport decide mm-hmm. to include a woman in it, it was like amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, again, in high side, maybe I would ask for a little bit more money. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, learn, you learn as you go. And... Uh, and uh, yes, it was a very cool thing. And I, I'm actually happy they came full circle because right now I made a company into the video game space. And and when I speak with a bunch of people from the industry, I'm like, you know, before starting the video game company, my experience was just being in the video game. I didn't <laughs> know much about it, you know. So it came oh, it's full really circle. cool though, really cool. So that you, it was for Freak Style as well, was EA Sports yeah. as well, no? yeah. yeah, I was in both of them, the Supercross 2000. And then there was kind of like, a next generation game was like the freak style and it was super cool that game actually won a lot of awards and uh, and you know a lot of people still nowadays say that they were their favorite game you know mm, back yeah, then cool. i had it i had it as well yeah it's really I good had, i had the ufo gear in that game yeah yep, the orange <laughs> ufo <laughs> gear <laughs> I think I've got some pictures of that in a minute. I've, I've got some of <laughs> I think. Um, obviously, you won many, obviously, Italian national championships. Uh, what did that mean to you at the time? And what was your sort of memories of that as well? Yes. Yeah, so, so the Italian women national championships started in mm-hmm. 1991. Uh, it was not. It didn't exist before, you know. And there was a bunch, a bunch of people from the federation and a lot of uh, women passionate about the sport. They pushed so hard to create this championship. So, the, it started in 1991. I was 14 years old and I won the first title. And uh, for me, it was like, of course, <laughs> you know, it yeah. makes sense. <laughs> You're always the um, first. You're always the first. So. <laughs> right. And again, you know, like uh, it's uh, it's. It comes with the territory. When you are like a, an athlete, at some point you're like that. Then you think back and you say, maybe I should have knocked it down a little bit. But <laughs> yeah. it is what it is. And um, yeah, so 1991. Then I had a couple seasons, 1992, 1993, that they were not really good for me because I had injuries. And then I start winning and like one after another in a row. And for me, I have to say, what was incredibly good was the fact that I was competing with the men too, with the boys. So, you know, you always want to compete. And this is an advice also for the girls out there that they are riding. You always want to compete with whoever is better than you. Because mm-hmm. if you have people that are faster than you, you can pick up and try to match them and try to learn from them. Never just sandbag because it doesn't make your career to grow, right? So mm-hmm. for me, the big difference, I guess, it was that I was never shy to compete with the men. And therefore, you know, competing with all the guys in, 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 in that level, it transferred to when I was competing with the girls. I was kind of like a step ahead of everybody else. Yeah. So that how it worked out for me for a day is that, why, is, that why, is that why you made uh, the decision to go to america as well to like obviously <laughs> so that's a funny story i'm gonna share it some yeah, of you yeah, will, yeah. Will, will laugh about it or, or even my baby maybe get mad about it but uh, so <laughs> what happened was actually this and um yeah. Maybe maybe kaz can relate on some of these things as she was saying okay. earlier yeah. so um i in back it was 1998 Okay, and uh, I wanted to become the first woman to race in the world championship. Okay, I was on the top of my game, you know, like uh, 19 years old, 18 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, I can do this. Okay, back in the days, it was working in a way that each country was doing those selective uh, trainings where uh, you are picked and say, okay, you have the you are at the level, come here. We'll do this training section and the fastest uh, top five will be representing the country, in my case, Italy, to go yep. to the World Championship, right? That's how it was right. set up back then, at least in Italy, it was like that. And I think yeah. it was actually normal because I think they only each each country was only allowed to be able to have five riders in the, in the World Championship back then. Okay. Anyway, so I go to the trials. I get the third the fastest time in the 125 class. I'm like, I did it. I did it. I was in clown now, you know, right? Like, 
I, I, I wow. achieved this. You know, yeah. I'm going to be the first woman to show the world that women belong in motor, motorsport and motocross, you know, at this level. Three days later, I get a phone call from the F FMI, which is the Italian Federation. Mm -hmm. And they said, we decide not to send you because you are a woman. Oh. So I show everybody the bird. <laughs> yeah. And I'm Literally. like, yes. And I'm like, perfect. I'll go to America. Let me show you. <laughs> so wow. that's my story. You know, like, so that's why I, I went to America. I, at that point, I, I, the dream that I had at six years old, mm -hmm. it was more like moved into wanting to race in the world championship, you know, instead of go to America. But I guess that's what, what my destiny was because this happened. And um, so I didn't speak a word on English back then. So yeah. I, I got my bags. Uh, my mom and dad said, you're crazy going in America by yourself. This coming from a family that barely left Italy. So you can <laughs> yeah, imagine. Yeah. You know? imagine yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted it. I wanted it so bad that there was nothing stopping me. So when I came to the wow. United States, uh, I got the support from Kawasaki. And I needed to do, because in America, it was working actually in this way. So to be able to have the professional license, to be able to compete in the professional series, you have to score points in a selective professional race, um, uh, amateur races by the top level. They're called the A class, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. or the pro sport class yeah. so uh, i did all my points i remember back then i was racing with travis pastrana and more often than not he was first i was second and maybe he was waiting a couple of times you know i did this i waited I, I was not that far behind but he waited you know like maybe on the final lap and on the final jump we were jumping together and touching hands you know like uh, wow. and, and it was cool you know like uh, cool, yeah. growing up with travis i mean not growing up because i was already an adult but like do these experiences with travis were very yeah. cool but matter of the fact i got my points i got to the ama i say i wanted to do this those are my points and ama couldn't deny it so they didn't do it like they did it in italy they thought twice about discrimination right yeah, yeah. so i got my license and in 2000 i started to compete professionally and i did um Supercross and I did monocross and also the women's series and that's how I went to the United States and again it's another thing that came full circle which uh, mm. I think you know in life things happen for a reason in 2005 when I got asked by the the FIM and the FMI you know and and you stream back then to be able to become the first woman to compete in a round of the world championship i told everybody absolutely this is how much it's going to cost you and they paid oh, so beautiful Love it's that. funny that you know like sometimes you yeah. will do something in your life and i would spend every single penny you know in my life to be able to do that back yeah. then yeah. you know like just to do what you love and uh, that was denied i found another way and then you know i got rewarded for it that was amazing so like you said another door closed again and you just went for it in america yeah i, I always say to everybody also not just in motocross or on on in, on, on in sport but in life as a whole always yeah. find a way if you believe in something it doesn't matter if there is a mountain in front of you there are options to get around it you can go around it on top underneath make a tunnel there are ways <laughs> you know what i mean so just go for what you love uh kaz has just come back on and she said uh in 1974 i did a practice I got second in the first race, and then my dad was told that the girls were not allowed to ride at that club. That's how it was in the early days. So yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel you. I know. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. I know how it is, how it was, and mm. it's still there a little bit. It's it's uh, not as bad as uh, back in the seventy or like uh, in the late nineties for me, but uh, it's still there. But it, we can all do our little thing to to make it make it different, though. Um, did you have any uh, regrets in your career at all? Any sort of bikes or rides that you probably, in hindsight, wish you didn't ride or anything like that? Did you have any regrets at all? I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I'm completely happy how my career turned out. Maybe the yeah. only regret, if I can call it that, is like not to have messed up that jump. The, it destroyed my ankles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got that now. No, coming up next. Yeah, but uh, 
No, that's okay. But beside that, you know, like uh, I, I think everything happened for a reason and yeah. uh, by resilience and keeping passion and wanting to do what I always dream about doing, you know, I'm totally happy with whatever happened to me. Even the time that uh, in 2001, I lost the championship at the last race because two, actually this time was to my friend Tanya that we were talking earlier yeah. because my chain broke. What in the world a chain breaks in monocross nowadays, right? Wow. My chain broke and I couldn't finish the race. And then, you know, I lost the title right there. And yeah. is it regrets? Yeah, I thought I, 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 it, it was my title, you know, again. Yeah. But uh, whatever, hard things happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to take. Obviously, uh, you had that awful uh, career-ending injury. That was both your ankles, wasn't it? Is that right? Yep. Yeah. What exactly happened with that? And uh, then what happened with afterwards and what you did uh, yeah. for a while until now? So um, I was on the Honda team, you know, yeah. back then. And I was on the four-stroke uh, already uh, because yeah. it was 2005. And I was already one year on being on the four-stroke. So what had happened is, like, back then, the team was uh, uh, David Millsap, uh, Josh Grant, and Trey Canard. And I was there and working with them at David Millsap Place because he had a huge, he has still a huge facility yeah, where yeah, uh, you yeah. can train. And we were doing testing right there, right? So, yeah. of course, you know, like, they're faster than me. You know, there's not... not denying on that but we were, wor were uh, working on section you know like and learning and for me it was like incredible because I can learn from those incredible guys yeah. so it was all good and then at one point there was a this jump that David decided to make pretty much from two tabletops a double so okay. it was a 150 foot double at the end oh. right and of course and again that comes with the cockiness you know mm -hmm. like the boys were saying oh yeah let's do this it could be super fun and i'm like okay you do it and i'll watch you know and then i'll tell you you know so of course david he was in the 450 even mm -hmm. so you know you just jump it you know like upside down you're know, whipping it and, and landing and they're like, okay. And then, you know, then they start like, come on, don't be sissy. <laughs> you know, oh, like, no. you, can, you can do it too, you know. And I'm like, okay, I'll follow you. So I follow Davey. So as you, a lot of you know, you know, that like um, sometimes that's a good technique to yeah. follow the speed of somebody on the jump if you're mm -hmm. not sure how to do it. So I followed him and copied the speed and, you know, I made it four times. Hit the jump, of course, he whipping it. Me more like, I want to get to the other <laughs> side. <laughs> but I did it, you know, it was good. So brilliant, then, yeah, brilliant. So then, you know, like we got to the starting gate because uh, at that point we decided it was time to do a moto, you know. And by the time we got to that part of the track, the guys were gone, you know, in front of me. So I didn't have anybody to follow anymore. And I still nowadays don't know what happened. I don't know if there was a mechanical problem, was me there i was not sure enough or i have not don't i don't know what happened matter of the fact that i was in the air yeah. and i know that i was coming up short meaning like landing on the face of the second tabletop and those yeah. and those jump were, were very steep ramps so yeah. not not pretty and i remember the first thing in my head when i was in the air was like dang i'm gonna miss next week race <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> as a true racer, right? Yeah, yeah, proper racer, yeah. And then the second thought was like, ah, this is going to hurt pretty bad. So I bounce it off. I crash it so hard on the face, on the bottom face of the second tabletop. So hard that I bounce off of it. Wow. Yeah. And uh, rolled a couple of times. Luckily, the bike didn't hit me. And uh, I decided to stay on the bike because, you know, like you have split second to make decision in motocross. And I thought that maybe, you know, the suspension were going to help a little bit more. than just jumping off, you know, and maybe break my back. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so kind of like rolled. I got the end in the stomach. So for a, a, a couple of minutes, I couldn't even breathe because, uh, you know, I kind of like got onto the stomach and part of my lungs and it was very hard to breathe so then everybody Davey is the first one coming back there and then his mom and all the other people and then they're like are you okay and then you know as a, as a rider you still like inventory yourself right so <laughs> yeah, this, is work, this is working so <laughs> I, I got I got I had a dislocated elbow you know from the impact and then uh, I had my right leg that I thought that I broke my tib and fib you know that feeling was over there mm -hmm. and uh, david's mom said and i told her like that's broken you know like uh, it's it's a broken leg 
And um, she said, okay, let's take off the boot right away, my Alpine Star boot, and, and see, you know, what, what, what happened because otherwise it's wall up, you know, it's better to take it out right away. As soon as she moves the boot out, my ankle on the sock looked like a bag of bone. It was destroyed. Like, it was like pieces everywhere. And at that yeah. point, unfortunately, I got in shock, which I think is yeah. a normal reaction, yeah, you yeah. know, like, and I remember that I couldn't even, Cold because of course all the riders at the facility they had the surgeon on speed dial right, but <laughs> I didn't yeah. even know really? you know how, how to call the surgeon you know so because I was in shock they took care of it so David's mom actually because the old facility is a little bit far in in the in the in the country so to wait for an ambulance to come and bring back she just brought me you know she they just David just put me in the car of his mom and uh, and she drove me to the hospital and I remember we go in um, we called the sur she called the surgeon and says Stephanie's sh surgery right away so they were all waiting for me you know and and the uh, at the hospital and uh, go there and then uh, Immediately, you know, I took the first x-rays and whatnot, and the surgeon tells me, we do an emergency surgery, but it's 1% chance that we can save your leg. Well, at that point, I was in morphine, and I was still mm. asking, okay, but when can I race again? Like one month, <laughs> two months? <laughs> two weeks. Because <laughs> that, that's, you know, the mentality, that's the mentality yeah, yeah. of the racer. And they were like, say, no, you don't understand. You might not be even having a leg again and they're like okay i understand that i can i can fix that part when can i raise <laughs> you know so and yes so the injury actually evolved in something a little bit more peculiar meaning mm -hmm. that uh, um, my right leg exploded like that and they piece it put it together like puzzle you know with screws and plates and whatnot and we were able to save it like what by doing a lot of like hot and cold therapy to try to revive you know, the, the yeah, lower leg. Yeah. yeah. And I do have a lot of arthritis in that leg. I have my leg. But what was very peculiar is that my left leg immediately, nobody knew what was going on with that. Matter of the fact, that like uh, two weeks into the injury, the left one started to swell up, you know, like and doing crazy things. And then even like having fluid coming out of the skin. And it's like, what is going on? Yes. I'm not going to bother all of you with all of that medical detail, but matter of fact, I, I, had, I had developed uh, eventually a hole on the side of my, my heel yeah. that stayed open for uh, 10 years, you know, and, but yeah. nevertheless, I still live my life, I ride motorcycle again and whatnot, and I went all over the world, and uh, every doctor that I visit around the world, they said to me, it's impossible that you are walking. You need to have this leg amputated. And my answer was, you're not a doctor for me because clearly I just walked in here. So, <laughs> so I finally found somebody, again, full circle. I happened to be in Italy. My mom okay. saw this guy that was okay. doing own reconstruction on TV on a late night show. There was an interview about this professor. She yeah. told me, I call him uh, from the US. He said, I can fix this. For the first time ever, after 10 years, I got somebody that said, I can fix it. Wow. So I took the chance. And then there is other crazy stuff that happened between that and actually um, getting it done. But uh, yes, so I have my leg. Still, nobody knows what happened to their leg. They cannot explain it. They thought that it was a bone infection. But bone infection usually happen when you open something. And it was never open until I got that wound. You know, so it's very peculiar. As a matter of fact, mm. I have a, a pretty much a reconstructed ankle in in my left uh, in my left leg, and uh, yeah. So now I do mountain biking. <laughs> and I saw a, a video. Um, it was uh, sort of said in the video uh, about you coming back and you, you had your first go on the on the bike. And I saw yeah. that, and it was quite emotional, wasn't it? It's quite emotional. Yes, because like every rider relate to this, you know, like yeah. uh, you crash 10 times and you want to get up 11. So it's, your career is never complete if you don't do that. And uh, yeah. even though not, not just your career, but like how you feel for yourself is never complete until you do that. And uh, and this is a, a, 
uh, even guys or girls that get paralyzed, they always find a way to ride one more time. So for me, it was that. And uh, like you said, it was incredibly emotional because being told, uh, and at that point, my left leg was still a question mark, you know, oh, by yeah. the way. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, like be able to, you know, put my butt back on the saddle and twist that treadle, you know, I had the biggest smile on my face and have all of these people we did it in Italy. So all of these people, you know, like uh, coming over and cheering me on. It was a, a very yeah. emotional moment, but also was um, me to be at peace with the fact that I was not going to be a professional racer ever again. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, like a, uh, turning negative into positive, you know, and be able to do a lot of things in the industry, you know, help other people, you know, to be able to enjoy motocross. Yeah, I watched that. That was very cool. Um, got Mark uh, Palmer's put, I love this interview with Steffi. She's done so well in her career and is so honest and down to earth. Shame about her accident and ended her career, but well done what you achieved. Uh, someone's also just put amazing interview, Lee, so everyone's enjoying it. That's cool. Right, awesome. I'll just, uh, it's all right if we just go through a few pictures. Um, right, let's have a look. Let's get a few of these pictures oh. going. So here, if you want to, I'll tell you. So I'm, yeah, yeah. this is 2002, and yeah. behind is Jessica Patterson, which I was yeah. saying, and behind that is uh, Tanya Satchwell. So see the three that I to the two that I told you before. So yeah. in Those line, but battling it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, is uh, probably was in Bats Creek, I think. I don't remember exactly, but was another one of the women races. Uh, I probably had dislocated my shoulder, but still won the race. <laughs> yeah, just see that you put your ice on the arm of the something there. Yeah, something has happened. <laughs> I don't remember exactly, but <laughs> <laughs> still won. That's what counts. Yeah, <laughs> I got a nice one. As you talked about Travis, I got a nice one that yes. I spotted. Yeah, this is actually was a fairly recent, meaning like I think it was a four or five years ago that he came to Geneva to do yeah. a Nitro Circus event. And uh, I happened there, I was in Italy. So yeah. I, I text him and say, hey, you are in Geneva. I'm going to come and watch. I say, yep, how many tickets you need? <laughs> you know? Oh, that was so, beautiful. <laughs> so I just Thank drove you. up and then, you know, hang around with him. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, this is, I don't remember who is this uh, athlete with mm. me. But this is a uh, 1999, so the first year that I won all the races um, in the uh, in the United States in the women class, and that track is Glen Ellen. I was just about to say I, I could start to recognize that hill there. There's a nice one here. <clears throat> yeah, this is a photo shoot that was done uh, in Florida, and uh, Florida there is a lot of sand. So yes, this is, it was a fun photo shoot. A lot of like berm, and and laid it down. It was. Uh, Fun times. Love Gotta yeah. love the berms, Steffi. Uh -huh. <laughs> Gotta love the berms. Yeah, this is actually when I raced at the World Championship. They didn't yeah. give me my number 211. I was very disappointed about that because, mm -hmm. as I told you all before, I was making my brand on that. Yeah. Yeah. They gave me number 114, which is good because I feel like there is also a connection to that. You know, number 114 has been a number from uh, Livia Lancelot that she is an incredible athlete and she yeah. also i think she's the first one that got a point in the mx2 because she ended up racing in a, in a thailand and yeah. uh, were able to get a point you know in that so she's the first woman to actually get the point so i think it kind of goes together you know like the number so it's kind of like a continuation you know for women in in racing in in the world championship uh well, that's it that's you this is when you did your obviously your mx school um, yeah. what, was, what was that like? It was it was cool. It's in different aspects. For mm -hmm. me, what I really appreciated and I really liked was the fact that, that uh, because I couldn't ride, so mm -hmm. I couldn't show people. And a lot of motocross schools are like that. Like uh, there is the coach that like, let me see, show you how you do the turn. And then mm -hmm. they talk about it, you know, but it doesn't really relate as much to to the racer or the or the student because people do things in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. So I figured out right a method where I was able to relate to everyday physics to mm -hmm. explain what you need to do in, in, a, in, a, in a corner or on a jump or, uh, you know, like on a straightaway and whatnot. And uh, that was very appreciated by everybody that worked with me because you get it. You know, it's like, oh, I get it. You know, it makes total sense, you know, like, uh, so... 
but I did it because I couldn't ride, so I couldn't show. I need to reinvent and figure out ways to how to do it. This is Sebastian Tortelli. We ended mm -hmm. up doing a school together, that's you know, and, <laughs> and it was good. And that's something that a lot of riders fall onto when they are done with their career. <laughs> you know, yeah. the tech, they started doing schools. And yeah. um, so it was my route too at the very beginning. And I enjoyed it. I, I work with a lot of women. And um, also guys, but, you know, mostly women and uh, like to have given them some more uh, confidence on how to tackle the track and then have a better race time. Got a nice one here from... Yeah, this is more in the khaki days. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take that down so you can see the full bit. As you see. <laughs> <laughs> this one was a, a, an advertisement made by Bear Ray. It was my mm -hmm. one of my sponsors, and they put it out all on the magazine. Back then, you know, social media was not uh, a tool yet, so you're still going down to the magazine and... I think it was pretty cool, you know, like how Very they put cool. it out because I think they, they tried to eat the fact that, yes, I'm a woman, but yes, I belong there. And I think yeah. that kind of comes out from that picture. Nice. Very cool. See, so you've got, uh, a, bit of, I've got uh, a few of these. A bit of a photo is, shoot there. This is funny. You might not know this. I don't know if you found information about this one, but uh, yeah. this is in Qatar. So okay. back in the days, they organized an event in Qatar, the late Georgia Bay. Okay. You know, made the um, this event where they decide to bring in the Middle East for the first time a ton of uh, um, people from um, from the world, you know, riders, yep. and show yep. the Middle East that the stuff could be done, you know, on motorcycle. Okay, yep. okay so this was the first event, and this I was doing a, a, a little bit of photo shoot in uh, in the sand over there, and it was yeah, and it was super <laughs> cool. So there was uh, I raced with Pete Byer. Now, oh, the KTM nice. boss, yes, yeah, yeah. at this event. There were Joel Smets, all people that I know very well now, you know, like, and <laughs> I raced with them back then. There were yeah. Michael Pichon, even. And, uh, yeah, they ended up inviting a bunch of people, you know, like, and show that uh, we could do this event. And for me, they show up there with bleach blonde hair, as you see. <laughs> at the airport, I have to have escorts. So mm -hmm. I spent the entire... Um, five, six days that we were there, you yeah. know, like, because we did a lot of media stuff and whatnot with escorts because women wow. in the Middle East, you know, they are not as freely as I was showing, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, they had to provide escort for me. and uh, But they still did it. And it, believe it or not, that was the, the first step to try to uh, create a federation, motorcycle federation in uh, in Qatar, that then yeah. eventually led into the Qatar MotoGP and uh, the Qatar motocross races and so on and so forth. This was uh, where it started. Wow. I've got a call cool here. <laughs> that <clears throat> is uh, some cool style, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing like a one-hander, Steffi. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, that was back in the days. And uh, again, you know, this was uh, the first year that I got to the United States uh, when I was doing all my points to become uh, uh, to get the pro license. I was given number 77. So I used that for, uh, for, the, for the year before getting the 211. And yes, this was a massive double. It doesn't maybe look like that, that here, but it was... Starts to be very big, and even yeah, doing that like one-ended back in the days, it was like ah, you sketchy. know, okay. <laughs> it's sketchy. Yeah, uh, I like that. I can see that's bigger. I can see that's bigger. Yeah, it's cool. <clears throat> okay, this is Loretta Lynn's. So. Yeah. It's kind of like a rite of passage in the United States to have to have a royal in titles. Um, I felt very conflicted, and I, I explained to you why because. Mm. Uh, uh, Loretta Lynn's is amateur, is amateur racing. And I was a professional. So I'm like, I don't want to do Loretta Lynn's. You know, it sends the wrong message. You know, mm -hmm. you cannot do Loretta Lynn's if you are professional. Also for all the women coming up, what kind of message they're going to get? You know, like that there is no way to become a true professional athlete because you have to race Loretta Lynn's, right? Mm -hmm. But peer pressure and Honda wanted me to do it, so I ended up doing it. But done it, dusted, it, got the title, so <laughs> that's it. But after that, you know, I always kept telling everybody, please, please, if you want to race professionally, 
don't do loretalins. Do loretalins until you turn pro. But mm. after that, don't go back because then you send the, the wrong message to your sponsor, to the audience, and to the industry as a whole, as a female. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice one here with Tony. Yeah, Tony, of course. <laughs> as, as an Italian, in the top Italian uh, athlete in the world, you know, it, it's good. And it's very nice, the, the respect. So I like that, you know, like yeah, we know nice. each other. And, oh, boy, this is very old. <laughs> yeah, I told you I dig. Yes. <laughs> this, I was probably like 15 years old here, 16 years old. Oh, yeah. Man. Around that, yeah, that was a 125, of course, it's a Honda. This is in Italy. I don't remember the track. I don't recognize it. But, uh, yeah, you know, like still uh, my long hair, you know, before yes. I ended up doing the bleach blonde uh, situation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes, I think it was probably 1992 this year. I like that. I like that set. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, this is Unadilla. And this is a, a AMA national. This is with the guys. So it's uh, probably there are like a, a, quali a qualifying um, yeah. a race with the guys. And Yunadilla, mm. the year before, yeah. or no, a couple of years before that, when I was still on the Kawasaki, I had an incredible experience, actually. It was pouring rain, like mm -hmm. like so much rain, like you guys yeah. have in the UK often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, a lot of rain, and here I am. I had uh, um, uh, Michael Brown on my side here, and uh, don't remember his first name, but second last name is Payne, Bill, Billy Payne, I think. So two pro circuit rider, full on yep. pro circuit rider, one year and one year, and I'm in the middle, and I pulled the all shot. Wow. It was insane. I remember, you Mental. know, like I couldn't see anything, not for the rain, but for the flashes of the photographer that everyone started like, yeah, yeah, good job. The camera because they saw me, you know, pulling the old shot in front of this. This was uh, my first experience, not with this bike, like I said, this is Unadilla, but I was with the Kawasaki Before, yeah. that, yeah, yeah. that happened. And um, it was the time that I got so close to make it in. I was a sixth until the last lap. So they were taking the top 20, right? So I was yep. six. I'm like, okay, I'm in. You know, like yeah. a six in the in the thing. And then this guy, there was a KTM factory rider. Mm -hmm. Somehow decided to T-bone me. And he oh. crashed also. So yeah. both of us went down to the last lap. And instead, and nobody, neither of us qualified. And I was mm. so mad. It's like, why? Why did you do that? We were both in. You know, like, why did you have to T-bone me? And it oh, is one no. of these things with the racing, you know. Not good. Not good. Yeah. This, <laughs> this <laughs> is a... a, a this is when I won the world title. So let me explain to you when I say world title, what it means. Mm -hmm. Because those, the, the, the world title that I claim and that the FIM tells me that it's okay to claim were before the FIM established the world championship. Okay. So what it means is that there were these events uh, in, in Italy and in Europe uh, and in, uh, in, uh, in America where they were called the World Championship for Women because there were women coming from all over the world to compete in this particular race. Okay. It was a one-shot race and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, this was in 1999. And uh, I competed in, in the 125 and the 250, so double duty that day, and I won both of them. So, you know, that's why when I say world titles, you know, those are my world titles because I didn't have to do it in, uh, in I never got the chance to do it in the FIM Women World Championship because it didn't exist back then. Yeah, 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 so, okay. you know. That's it. But, you know, I wanted to clarify with the, with the FIM just to make sure. And they're like, you are a legend. What do you worry about? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. That's, that's true. I'll agree. <laughs> Got a cool one here. Oh, boy, that's very young. This is, seems like uh, in Italy, yeah. 1998. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that's what uh, world champion in 1998. And I don't remember where we were here. But oh my god, I look so young. <laughs> but yeah, yes, I like, I like digging for photos. <laughs> you do a good job. I, thought, I like this. I like this. 
Yes, so probably this uh, was uh, um, uh, like a sponsor by, this is a Scott Goggles and it was sponsored yeah. by them. Yeah. And uh, when uh, you go at the races in America, they prepare all this goggles for all the riders yeah. and uh, they know what the rider prefers, mm -hmm. you know, like, so they just had to prepare it and then, you know, I was always Steffi, you know, like in the industry, I'm, yeah. I'm Steffi. Everybody, when they say Steffi, they don't even have to say my last name, you know, in yeah. the industry, they know there's, there is one Steffi, you know. I, love that. I hope I've got all the pictures, right? <laughs> oh boy, that's also so old. <laughs> this is a 1990, no, it was not 91. So, okay, so this it might be 92 and the one that you showed early was 93. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, this is a, yeah, <laughs> back in the days, oh my God, look at the people <laughs> too around. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's totally a different world. It, it I, is, rem isn't it? I remember something very funny about that, uh, the gear. Yeah. Uh, that was a Technocell. Technocell was a company oh, yeah, back in the that. day that they, they, they did the seat cover. Yeah. And um, they, they were like the leading in the industry for that. They were yeah. sponsoring everyone, you know, like, and they were incredibly good. And the company was fairly close to where I was born. So yeah. I became friend with the owners. And then they decided yeah. to, to, to work into the gear because, you know, mm -hmm. As branding, you know, awareness, yeah, yeah. gear shows more. And I remember I signed a contract with them and I was riding their gear and they didn't last long, but for me, you know, it was a way to bring in a little bit of money, you know, helping a company and um, it was a win-win situation for everybody. Uh, just before I do a couple more pictures, I'm just going to go back to show you some of the comments that are just quickly coming in. Okay. Um, I've just got Bob there that's come on and put, what an incredible lady, so much passion and enthusiasm. We could all do with some of that tonic at the moment. Lovely yeah. interview, Lee. Well done, and thank you, Steffi. Uh, my yeah. mum's just come on. <laughs> my mum likes to come on. She's put amazing career and what a lady. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> uh, and then, oh no, oh, there we go. We got he, uh, Barley put. Have you met Valentino Rossi? And <laughs> I've got the answer to that. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so like I said, you know, for me. It's, it's a little bit sad in a way, but uh, mm. my career exploded once I show Italy that mm. I have done it in the US. Yeah. So everything I did in Italy was like, uh, whatever, you know, like, but once I start being successful in the US and start having yeah. recognition in the US, then Italy is like, oh, come home, you know. <laughs> yeah, come home, you're famous. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. you know, like, uh, I guess because of that, you know, like it, our industry is very small at the end, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. so you ended up knowing a lot of people. And yeah. of course, Valentino is an icon in, in motorsport as a whole. So, yes, I, I got to meet him a few times. I, this is, was a, at the Indianapolis uh, um, MotoGP race a few years ago. So I was in the, in the, in the pits and um, in the box. And um, we took a picture together and it was cool. It's like, hey, Steffi. I was like, oh, wow, you recognize me even now that you're here racing. So it was wow. kind of like precious, you know, like the, he said that. Okay. And, uh, that was very cool. But then also, you know, I met him very young, you know, we, in Milan, near Milan, there was a small track where you were going with this uh, mini mini bike, you know, yeah. like, mini I don't remember bike. how you really called them, but like, they're, they look like a road bike and they're very small and you, yeah. you ride them with your knee completely out, you know, yeah, like, yeah. and, uh, and uh, I, I was doing a, f a few of those things. I had one of those little things and, uh, and uh, Vale was coming over often. So we were doing like midweek. He was, he was already famous, but not like yeah. as it is right now. And we were yeah. battling the track, you know, and pushing each other yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> nice, yeah. And it was oh, very fun, fun to do. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> this is an, an interview. This was done in Daytona, and uh, yeah. it was uh, a few years ago. This is Luigi. He is uh, one of the yeah. announcers for uh, the motocross season, but also works yeah. with Racer X. Yeah. And yes, you know, like he saw me and said, hey, what's up? What's in your world right now? And we just bring up a, an interview right there on the spot. <laughs> of course. It was on the cuff, off the cuff. That was pretty cool. I uh, got a nice one there. Yeah, that's another race. I don't even know why the yellow number plate that it, I don't remember. I, do, I think it sound it looks like a Glen Ellen again. Um, mm. 
see by looking a little bit in the back and, the, and knowing mm. the dirt over there. Um, I don't remember this particularly. It's probably is, this it looks like a 250 too. So probably I was uh, mm. riding a 250 uh, for some international event, maybe. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so here I was uh, nine years old Brilliant. and uh, coming from, uh, this is all boys, and mm -hmm. uh, sliding in the first turn as the whole shot. So yeah. this is kind of like a give you a little bit of an idea how dominant I was in my scene. And yeah. uh, a couple years uh, uh, older than me, there was um, a, a few people probably remember Kiko Chiodi. Yeah. And uh, world champion him too, and uh, we became friends. And I was always admiring how quick he was. And we yeah. never really raced together because uh, we were different age. And you know, yeah. in youth, you youth, you yeah. you race your age. But mm -hmm. it, it was it was a uh, stamp in my same ground. So it was cool, you know, like uh, to do that. Uh, was this uh, you on here? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, super, supermoto. So, uh, supermoto cool. kind of like exploded in the United States for a couple of years in 2003, 2004, uh, maybe more 2004. And um, Red Bull decided to become the sponsor of, uh, of the series and invited a bunch of people to go and do the race. So, a race with Jeremy McGrath, also with uh, Jeff Ward. You know, like a bunch of people, a bunch of icons of the sport that got together and Honda gave me the bike and the wheels and we put it all together and uh, Alpine Star gave me the leather and uh, yeah, and said, so go and have fun. And I did. And uh, those were invitational races. So there was not like a qualifying or whatnot. It was just a group of, uh, of people and uh, it was a way for Red Bull to try to establish the sport in the US. And um I was asked to participate and, you know, I never say no, so. <laughs> Did you enjoy that? It was good. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I like the sliding part. This is not definitely yeah. one of my best ones because yeah. you're supposed to, to slide a little bit more than that. But uh, mm. um, it was good. You know, something different is it's an hybrid sport. You know, I don't know if any of you tried, but, uh, you know, as dirt and, and, and asphalt. And uh, it's fun. To me, it is something that can... The idea behind it was something that could be done, at least in the U.S., and more in in a, in a, in an urban setting, mm -hmm. you know. So try to bring a motorcycle more into the cities, beside mm -hmm. having to use the stadium. And um, um, Red Bull put a lot of money behind it and behind the concept, but it really never really quite took off. You know, I mean, there is the the super the supermoto uh, championship still right now, but it it is nothing at the level of motocross or road racing or uh, or supercross so ah this is when my little sister <laughs> <laughs> you know i told you earlier at the beginning you know that she's always been with me so yes yeah, li literally yeah <laughs> yes so that is my little sister and uh, probably mm -hmm. here i'm around 10 11 years old something like that, maybe 12 this is a was a shift bike because mm -hmm. you know youth in italy you know like uh, up until i think 11 you use uh, uh just automatic, automatic back in the day back in the day and uh, and then now it's all different now you are on the on the ktms you know or cobras or whatever very early actually mm -hmm. i really really like the fact that uh, now companies are investing in the electric side of things. That's another big passion of mine. I don't know if you noticed know that in Supercross now, the Supercross um, uh, KTM Junior is done with electric bikes. How is it? Mm -hmm. This year is all done with the electric KTMs instead of the 65s. But yes. It seems, it seems, seems to be heading that way, uh, yeah. Steffi. Do you, what do you think about that? It seems to be heading that way. When I spoke to Gordon Crockard, uh, uh, from Honda, he was talking about it's all going to go the electric way. Mm -hmm. and well, like I, that. What, what's your thoughts? I worked in a, in the electric industry a little bit for uh, mm -hmm. um, bicycle, mountain biking, but also with an eye on on the motorcycling. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean it's a no brainer. You know, with the 
first of all, you can control the power of the motorcycle super easy from a, the point of view of a parent because there are mapping, you know, like so you can yeah. give a chance to be able to a kid to grow into a motorcycle instead of putting him or her onto, you know, immediately a, a 65, they kind of like, you first you gas and you whoop it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's a particularly good thing. Also, because they are silent, you know, it becomes a possibility for people to do this in areas where, uh, you know, motorcycle cannot necessarily go, you know, like especially in, in, in California here, but also, you know, in a lot of places in the U.S., it's becoming a little bit difficult to go trail riding because people don't want people out there ripping up the trails with with motors you know like mm. and this gives a possibility to go ride fairly close to home instead of like driving a couple hours to go to a track so and plus you know like it's where the world is heading you know again i'm a big supporter of electric also the electric car movement and 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 the electric bicycle movement so we are going that way i feel like the alta motorcycle they had a very good program going, a very good motorcycle, but they maybe were a little bit too early for the times. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I feel that it's going to be brushed back out in a few years, uh, the project. And, uh, you know, as soon as the colossal brand starting to understand and put uh, infrastructure and also budget to develop electric, the races is not going to change. You know, but when they're going to start doing that, we're going to see maybe in 10 years time, we're going to see Supercross on electric bikes. Mm. Be very interesting. Very it interesting. will be. <laughs> yeah, this is the one uh, then uh, when I did the the World Championship round in Italy at Castiglione del Lago. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, I don't know if you guys recognize these people, but uh, this was Zerbi, that was the FIM president. Then there is uh, Gi yeah. Giuseppe Longo and then Sherb, which is uh, the Motocross Commission, FIM Motocross Commission president back then. Mm -hmm. And yes, they were congratulating me. They give me this uh, iconic red plate because, uh, you know, I made history. <laughs> and yeah. uh, they, they gave th that to me and and it was cool. It was a very good thing. And again, it went full circle, like I explained earlier. Yeah, so for cool. me, it was a little bit also like a revenge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> After all that. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is a cool one too. This is a, a, a puzzle, as you see. This was a gift that was given to me. Somebody yeah. took this picture and made it a puzzle and then uh, added one of the races that was given to me and I put it together and I think it's still hanging in my house, in my mom and dad house in Italy. Nice. So yeah, this is a, just a downhill jump on a, on a, an Italian track. I think the year here is 1994, mm -hmm. 1994 or 1995, something like this. I've got another one in the same bike in a yep. magazine mm -hmm. there. Yeah, also on the Kawasaki back uh, back then. Yeah, this is this is when I started, you know, like uh, to embrace uh, the um, the um, the business away from racing, meaning like yeah. from one side of the fence to the other. Yeah. When I was able after the career-ending injury, when I was able to walk again, mm -hmm. uh, even though I still had the problem, but at least I was walking and I was not in a wheelchair. And, yeah. uh, and you know, I knocked on the door of a youth stream and uh, the championship, they started to think about making a world championship. So yeah. they said, who better than you can lead this uh, this effort and uh, they yeah. offered me the position to managing the the championship and I took it and for me it was a uh, super good because I got the chance to really be almost like a mama to all the girls yeah. you know like uh, and and tell them you know my experience and what has worked and what it didn't and what could help them you know to establish themselves as professional athletes and um, you know we all know that uh, for many years the championship really took off and then we got a little deep and now it's coming back up again so that's good to see mountain biking yeah <laughs> so this is like for me because i couldn't race anymore you know like a motocross because of the impact of my legs and whatnot i said i need to do something you know there is no way that <laughs> i cannot do it so i ended up this was just a race that i did in in atlanta no, near, sorry, near Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, it was a 50-mile race, mountain bike race, which the first 20 were uphill, 
And wow. back then was a regular ride. Now I ride e-mountain bikes because I love them, <laughs> you know, like, but back then it was kind of like my thing is like, I'm going to do this race. I'm going to finish it. It took me seven hours to do this 50 miles, oh, yeah. but uh, it was it was cruel. It was brutal. It was very hard. But, you know, like, again, coming from the fact that I had this injury and people still mm. that day say, we need to amputate your leg. You cannot do the thing you're doing. And I'm like, watch me. So <laughs> I ended up, you know, entering the race. And that was the number that I got given. And, uh, yeah, another good moment. Always turns into a challenge. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't this the one I'm pretty sure? Was this when you had the... Yes. That lo looks like the video I saw as well. Yeah, yeah. This picture yeah. is uh, exactly from the time that I rode the motorcycle for the very first time after the, the injury. Brilliant. So, yes, yes. Very nice. This is, was a, probably a few years later. Okay, so I don't own a motorcycle because yeah. I know that if I do, I will be out there <laughs> riding. There is no other way around it. So yeah. I, I'll do that with, like I said, electric mountain bikes. So that's good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, here and there, sometimes I see people and uh, they say, hey, you know, I have a bike. Do you have gears? And I'm like, mm, I can find gears. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so, so this was just one of the moment that i think it was a, a guy that had this kawasaki bike and i was riding in a, in a, this track and say hey do you want to ride my bike and i'm like mm -hmm. well <laughs> how can i say no you know like let me find <laughs> yeah. here so luckily i have a very good relationship with everybody in the industry and i can just pick up the phone and say hey i need a set of gear can you send it to me this yeah. guy's this case was axo and say yep where do you need it you know, and then they sent it and same for the boots and the helmet. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm much heavier, unfortunately, because it happens, you know, like after, yeah, yeah. after yeah. you do like you're a, you're a life on training and working out so much, you know, and then yeah. you stop, you like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm working on getting it off though. So that's a good thing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this is another one of the years with, um, the um, answer gear, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't remember this track. By looking at the dirt, it probably can be maybe even Bad Creek, you know. So how did that come? How did that come about, Steffi, with the helmet then? And obviously, they did the signature yeah. helmet, the M two R, wasn't it? Yeah, M two R. It was a company M two R. I don't think as assist anymore. It was absorbed by Bell, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was a company that started up and really wanted to make a splash in the market and hire a bunch of riders like Grand Lanston, one of them, you know, and uh, there were uh, quite a few, you know, high up, you know, riders. And uh, they wanted to sign me and I looked at that as a possibility to say, hey, what about we'll do a signature helmet? There is no woman out there that has one, you know, like, let's try to, to do that. And they loved the idea. And uh, I work with the artist. They made the, the thing and kind of like resembling a little bit the sun and the moon of Valentino. They used that oh, yeah. uh, for uh, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I'm a sunny person, I would say, so I like the sun. <laughs> so I think uh, it, it was good, a good idea. So we um, decide on the on the on the design, and then uh, yes, they put it into production, and uh, they sold quite a bit of them all over the the world. And I think. I don't think it was just necessary because it was my name. Probably yeah. was also the design, you know. Like, but uh, I'm very proud. Don't know about of it. that. Don't know about that. <laughs> Being but modest I'm, there. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. You know, like yeah, very something. cool. That is amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Everybody loves the replica helmets and stuff like that. I even remember having an Italian one myself. I had a Puzza BFE yeah. replica, the luminous yellow one. He had that was pretty cool. I had one of them. Yeah. Very cool things to do. Is another nice one. Yeah, this is, a, I think this racetrack is a, um, Hangtown over in uh, Sacramento. And uh, that was my mechanic at the time. So this is just behind the gate, getting ready to get lined up. Is that the helmet there with the... Yep, yeah, it's that same helmet. I see the sun lit on the side, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice, nice one there with Chad. Yeah, with Chad. Like I said, you know, like I've been in the industry for so long. And, Amazing. you know, like when... Uh, when uh, 
I think like if you always lead as a good person, you know, like and uh, respect others and, you know, everybody understand that there is the cockiness years, you know, like, <laughs> but after that, and you are in the industry, you know, everybody, you know, everybody, everybody knows you. So that, that was with Chad. And this was, um, this one was, a, again, another one of those episodes. This was in Italy at the Ottobiano track mm -hmm. um, where they do, they do some of the round of the uh, GPs and, um, uh, yeah, this was actually a girl that had this bike and she knew that I was in Italy and was like, hey, do you want to ride my bike? And again, I'm like, hmm, <laughs> yeah. let me call, let me make a couple of calls if I can get gear <laughs> again. <laughs> again, can't turn it down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I've uh, got a cool one, a funny one there. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you need to get I'll it. Take it out a bit away. There we go. Take that away. Yes, this was uh, like uh, back in the day, there were uh, uh, some people that, uh, and a company that make those t-shirts, you know, there was the two on one in the front and then the, the website uh, link in the back. And uh, this is was somebody, this guy, I know the guy is somebody that was um, involved with women racing for uh, quite a few years. And I recently, like maybe a couple of years ago, uh, him and his wife are in, in San Diego. And uh, I was in San Diego and uh, I called them up say hey are you guys around it would be cool to to see you and he showed up with that shirt <laughs> it was impressive it's cool. it's super it's old cool. you know? <laughs> yeah it's very nice still to have that as well it's really nice yeah um who were the who were the big influences in your career <clears throat> Steffi? <clears throat> well definitely my mom and dad because you know without without them you know i could have done any of this because mm -hmm. parents are like a the most important thing and uh, and you know i was in, i feel incredibly lucky that I had two incredible parents you know that supported me uh, like that so my parents for sure you know like uh, but beside that i'm very much like a, a self-made person you know like uh, i i like to see what other people do mm -hmm. and um, i tend to put myself always on on the same level and uh, Meaning like uh, I pick up the phone and I call people and uh, you'll be surprised how many people replies, you know, you know, you know, Lee, yeah, you know, yeah. like because you call people. Very true. and, very true. and uh, you know, like I did that in the past. Now I'm doing that for others, you know, and I actually I'm vocal about it. I always say if there is especially a girl out there that wanted to learn, you know, how to get involved with this, don't be shy. Just you know, reach out to me, you know, and, and, uh, and I help, you know, As, of course, you know, I cannot make a career out of it because I have no, my no. job, but, yeah, you yeah. know, like I definitely, I definitely help. And uh, so for me, you know, be able to be self-motivated was mostly like that. And, you know, I just called, I called people, I called Kawasaki when I was coming to the US. I, I was having a translator, you know, like a little book translator to, and one phone call, there was probably like two paragraphs. It took like 30 <laughs> minutes, <you know? laughs> but they listen, you know, like, and, you know, it's, it's like that. And I admire people, you know, what they do, like even outside of sport, especially you know, being a female, I admire what female do for the world in, in many different ways, like not to go into politics, but yesterday here mm -hmm. was an amazing day, you know, like with Kamela, you know, being the vice president. And yeah. for me, it's almost like anything else around there is white noise. What yeah. is important is Kamala, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> it's like inspirational to so many women and young girls from minorities or different walk of life that things can be done you know and uh, and i want to be like that too you know for uh, for other people so anything's that, possible as it were yeah work hard though nothing yeah. comes easy <laughs> need to need to go for it yeah full on was there a, did you have favorite uh was your, what was your favorite surface that you raced on was there did you prefer certain uh, types of tracks or my favorite what surface you know like did you oh, like surface, sand or yes. hard pack or um, no, I'm not super big fan of a, of a hard pack uh, yeah. because you cannot really be as creative as a mm. softer ground. Mm -hmm. um, I I would not say that I'm not uh, I'm a fan of sand, but I do like a, a more uh, loose terrain. And uh, luckily, mm. 
in the US, you know, they groom the track so deeply that the terrain, you know, always transform when you do the nationals. So, you know, it's always very soft, you know, mm-hmm. like no matter the track, even if it starts out to be, you know, like a, a hard pack, they groom yeah. it so much and the weather so much yeah. and it's very soft. Mm-hmm. And I like that because you can be creative because you can make so many different lines and, uh, you know, the, the track keeps evolving. That's one of the things I like a lot. It's like mm-hmm. always to, to, to adapt, you know, like, and mm-hmm. uh, so I really like that. I mean, I race, of course, on every terrain because tracks were and races were on every terrain, but uh, the, the so- softer clay kind of like a uh, grippy type of terrain is definitely was my, my favorite. Did you ever get to ride in the UK? Have you ever rode in the UK? No, I never rode in the UK. I never mm-hmm. made it up there. No, I I do have though a little girl that I follow, that mm-hmm. uh, is kind of like a little. I'm 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 her mentor, and okay. uh, this is a, a, an interesting story. Um, okay. I, if if you want, I'll, I'll touch base. I'm gonna try to be short. Yeah, go with it. Yeah, go, definitely. So um, the story goes like this. Like now yeah. is is about six seven years maybe even more, I don't, I, I don't remember anymore, but um, that I received an email, you know, from Zimbabwe, okay? Wow. And the email stated, uh, we want you to come to Zimbabwe to be a mentor and a coach to this little girl that she's nine years old and uh, that we think that she's going to be incredibly talented and, and uh, a, a, an important uh, athlete for the country. I'm like, delete. This is a scam, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen a few. <laughs> Delete. <Yeah>. So, <laughs> and another email comes in, you know, like, uh, and uh, and then, you know, same story. And I'm like, these people are persistent, but whatever, you know, what in the world from Zimbabwe? <laughs> you know, whatever. Delete. They did it again. So I'm like, okay, let me listen to this and let me figure it out. With a little bit like standoffish, but you know, like mm. figure it out. One of the best yeah. things I've ever done in my life. Wow. I ended up going to Zimbabwe. The governor paid my way to go down there. Yeah. I met I met this little girl and she was riding on flip-flops and a dress on a KX65, super old, right? Okay. So talented. Okay. You have no idea. I brought gear with me, you know, because when they show me those pictures, I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. You cannot ride like this, right? <laughs> So I call again, I call a few a few favors and say, there is an opportunity here. Want to help this girl? Can you help me out? Can you donate to some, some gear? Got the gear, got down there. The girl, you know, with the gear on looks like a professional athlete. And she never raced before. Yeah. Okay. So the story goes, you know, like that. I'm like, this is an amazing story. Her... Um, they, her mom and dad, they moved into more like the urban side of uh, uh, Arare, which is the capital of Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Her uh, grandparents still live in huts made of mud with no water. So that's the true Africa. You know, it's mm-hmm. something amazing. I, I suggest everybody to go and check around. Her name is Tania Muzinda. And uh, long story short, you know, got down there. I was interviewed on national television by the Minister of Sport, Sport, Gender and Youth, because they never had a work work, uh, class athlete going to Zimbabwe. So even that alone, you know, like was TV worthy. And uh, my God, you know, this this girl is amazing. And um, we made a plan to get her to develop her career. So starting from, uh, there is an air race track in Zimbabwe. So starting a little bit there, then go from there in South Africa which we know there are some athletes that come out from South Africa. Yeah, then from there sense. to Europe, which it goes back to what I, w- I was going to say, we mm-hmm. got her to come and do the Master Kids what Championship. The... She won the damn thing. No way. Yes, you need to ch- ch- check it out. check this out, definitely, yeah. Yes, she raced with wow. the boys. She yeah. won a model, and uh, I think she finished a third overall. And I believe she won the, the girl class. And um, but yeah, so like uh, I didn't get to to race in the UK. So in a way, I feel like a little bit of my extension did. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and and she is wow. she's a black girl, and she's amazing. And now she's in the US. So we got her to come in the US, and because of COVID, th- th- things are a little bit like on the sideline, but um, 
the plan now is for her to start the racing here in the United States. But I think it's amazing. It's like she's already been uh, um, on on the map of so many things that are so much bigger than motocross, meaning mm-hmm. like she's a little girl from mm-hmm. a country. The little girl, they, the girl in general, women, they're supposed just to make kids. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. she's bringing up a sport, which is male-dominated sport, being successful and she's mm-hmm. became she became a un ambassador already we got um, i don't know if you guys know the malala foundation which is uh, malala is this uh, lady from uh, um over in afghanistan that because of education she got uh, lynched by people and now she's running this foundation and she is into a prize no, uh, nobel prize and whatnot malala is recognizing tanya so it's kind of like wow. bringing motocross in front mm. of an audience that is, mm. it, it will never reach otherwise and for me that's yep. very powerful for us and uh, and again Tanya is it's now like a face of sports in Zimbabwe and in Africa as a whole and um, there is Greta Thunberg from the climate change uh, uh, movement that uh, is asking to, for uh, Tanya to become a representative for Africa for the climate change movement and she oh, loves wow. motocross so how incredible Brilliant. is that oh, so yes yeah, so, so you must be super proud about getting involved with that at the start yes yeah i, I know Amazing. you know like, we are like i'm kind of like a second mama to her oh, in a way nice. yeah, nice. and uh, you know and she's going to school in the u.s now which before she when i met her in africa she didn't go to school because c- c- girls don't go to school and mm. I, no, 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 we're gonna fix this right away and because of like being on the media and whatnot creates it's so much strange, attention yeah. that uh, yeah. it's school paid for the tuition for her to go to school so she got an education and now Again, she's here and but like changing the life of somebody just like that because we have a passion in common. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's pretty powerful and, and and everybody can do this. That's the 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 cool thing, you know. That's very special. Mm-hmm. You must be super proud of that. Do you yeah. know do you know much about the tracks in the UK or anything like that? Do you know any other tracks or well I know the famous tracks like Fox Hill, for instance. Yes. <laughs> you know? I was gonna ask you about that. So you know about Fox Hill? Yes, I do. Yeah. I do. And I wish, you know, I would have it. That was a track that was on my dream track to go and try it, you know, because it's an iconic track, you know, yes. and uh, I never got a chance to to ride there. But uh, definitely that's mm-hmm. one that, uh, that is on top of the list. Of course, I know Matterly Basing because I came and watched the, the, GP, yeah. the, the GP and also the Nations, you know, there. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think a Fox Hill is the, the most iconic one. Yeah, and it's literally five minutes from my house. It's always really? my home, hometown, yeah. So I've well, then seen I, need all the to, I need to come and visit you, and then you're going to have to have a bike, and you're going to say, hmm, do you want to ride? And I'm going to say, hmm, <laughs> let me make a go for kit a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what about another one? Another one, uh, Steffi, is, uh, I don't know if you've heard about Farley Castle. Yes, I heard of it. I'm not Ooh. as familiar uh, as mm-hmm. the look of the track as Fox Hill, but I have heard of it, yes. Yeah, it's quite natural. Um, mm-hmm. But they have like a big uh, vets, uh, this motocross mm-hmm. the nation's vets thing at the end of each year and stuff like oh, yeah. that. That's Maybe right. when you'd have to come over, they have a massive thing, all the American uh, yeah. famous guys come over and everything. It'd be amazing to get the the best of the women coming over as well. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't know if I can ride, mostly because... Yeah, even if you were there. Yeah, I know. To be there, I would love it. That'd I might really do a lap good. around the track, but I don't know about yeah. racing simply because I know how I am. You know, like yeah, if I switch yeah. off the yeah, race, yeah. there is no turning back. And, and you know, now that I, I was able to save my leg, I would like to keep them. You know? and, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I know that, you know, uh, if I get in an accident, you know, there is no saving anymore. So, But I know yeah. they do like laps of honours for some yeah. legends and stuff like that as well, which is really good. And yeah. it's, a, it's a massive, it's a great weekend and all the top you know, riders are there and your Ricky Johnsons have come over, yeah. all those sort of guys. It'd be really good. I, if you I, don't know that, I don't know the people that organize this. So mm. maybe if you want to put I do. the I'll, I'll get them. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. do. I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, love that'd it. be really cool to see you over there. It'd be great to meet you as well. Mm-hmm. So what are your plans going forward then, obviously, with your business and... Yeah, I mean, like right now we are 100% focused on uh, in sport and uh, the tournaments for the AMA. So, you know, people from all over the world, you know, will 
participate and how cool would it be to get a main number one plate from your living room you know in the yeah, uk that, right yeah yeah very good I, I think it can be cool but uh yeah so we are focusing on that and also expanding the business into motorsport as a whole because you know the attractiveness of video game in motorsport is the sim rig i have a, one there i don't know if you can see with a steering wheel right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like... Uh, that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's the attractive thing. So, because you can get that thing and the steering wheel and the pedals and you feel like you're in the car, you know, like, and, and it's super Brilliant. cool. So, we are, we are venturing into that, that section as well. Unfortunately, you know, it's so difficult to reproduce the feeling of a motorcycle. Yeah. So, you know, you're not going to be able to have a rig. They will give you the feeling to do a triple. At least not yet. You know, we'll see in the future. Yeah, but, um, sure yeah, but, uh, you know, like uh, focusing mostly on that and uh, still helping my little girl, Tanya. Well, she's not little anymore. She's 16 now. So, you oh, know, time flies. Yeah. 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 And, She's actually a young woman, I would say, yes. and uh, oh, yeah. and yeah. So this is my what I'm doing right now. And if ever anybody wants to learn more about the racing, you know, for uh, for esports, for the video game racing, they can go on the website. It's called initesports.com, mm -hmm. and there are information there. And uh, soon we're gonna come out with how to register for the championship. So you will have inf information about that as well. And um, yeah, I invite everybody to give it a try and become a Supercross and Motocross digital champion. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to share anything as well that you want to do, stuff like that. I'm happy to put that out there. Yeah. It seems, it seems to all go out now all over the world as well as the UK, so that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any any more plans of doing any motocross schools or the academies like you did before or anything like that anymore? Or? Uh, I mean... It could be. I mean, I love it. Mm. I really enjoy the connection with the people. Mm. Right now, I'm really, really busy in this uh, in this company. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, like I, I, I don't discount it. So you know, like uh, if we want to put together like uh, an event where uh, you know I can uh, I can be the coach and help the people, I, like I say, I have a hard time saying no, <laughs> you know, to things. Yeah. So I know and, I know how to do that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, is there any shout outs? Is, have you got uh, obviously you're on social medias and that your names if people wanted to check you out and obviously check yes. out these, uh, businesses and Yes, I'm not too, too much on Facebook, you know, like okay. I'm more like a, a watcher on Facebook than like okay. a, an, an engager uh, on Facebook. Okay, okay. Um, but yes, I do have my page on Facebook, but uh, I'm much more on to Instagram and, uh, and Twitter. Yeah. And um, yeah, th that's where uh, you can find me. And all my endor are at Steffi Bao, all mm -hmm. one word. So um, you can find me there. And um Yes, and uh, on Twitch, which is the platform where uh, the, the gamings are, uh, are played, if you want to start learning or have a look at that, you can look. Uh, I have my own, you know, which is twitch.tv slash Steffi Bao. But if you want to learn, you know, on what we are doing for the championship is actually twitch.tv slash Inity Sports. So those are places that you can go and look and see. I, I think Twitch is super cool because I got the opportunity to really engage with people like on mm -hmm. chats. Like yeah. right now, you know, what we are doing, you and me, you know, in that yeah. one, you can also have the chat and go in and during the race and it's super cool. I'm going to have to look into this Twitch as well because it says on this stream yard that I'm using for this that goes all onto your social media. You can use that as well. So mm -hmm. I can like add on that. <laughs> yes. I'll have to uh, ask you about that off of a uh, thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Over two hours with Steffi Bao. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. What a Thank love you. life. Love life. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. You know, it's, it's good to re rebring out, you know, like a moment yeah. from the past. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, hopefully, you know, I made you smile. And uh, yeah, yeah, just always go for what you love. Life is too short for doing otherwise. So very, very motivational as well, Steffi. I really appreciate your time as well. Absolute legend. Uh, thank you thank you I really thank you very much i will share all this uh, be recorded as well and then i'll share everything out tomorrow so i will hook you up with that as well and you can put it on your own social media i will do that mm -hmm. that'd be brilliant thanks ever so much bye for your you. time bye -bye. great to meet you as well Steffi. thank you very nice much to meet you. bye Cheers. everyone thank you bye wow Steffi bow love that and i can see that you all enjoyed that people um i will share that with her and that'd be uh, really cool yeah i really enjoyed that really good Really cool.
I can see you're all putting an uh, awesome lady. She sure is. What, what a lady, let alone a, a rider, a competitor. Absolutely brilliant. I will uh, speak to her as well off the thing and as well, and that'd be cool. What a legend. Steffi Bow. Great one. Really, really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. Damn, I was supposed to ask that as well, Barley. I was supposed to ask her about the Speedway question as well. Damn, I wonder if she has tried Speedway. She's definitely uh, been into everything else, Supermoto. She's done everything downhill. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I think um, when I share that out, got to get people to uh, watch that out there as well. It's really interesting. Great lady. David Kay, awesome lady. Big thanks to you both. Uh, Mick Nurse, very good, interesting woman. Great listen, Lee. I'm not sure who that was. Hopefully next time, you just have to, basically, before you come into the live, anyone that, does, that didn't do it, you can, before you come into the, if you come in through Facebook, otherwise it comes up like this, look, so I can't see who it is. All you literally do is before you go straight into the live, there's a link on the status of it. You just click on that and it basically just gives Facebook permission to use your profile and your name so instead of that instead of using that little facebook user you'll have like mick you see the profile and i can see who i'm talking to and then i can give you the good shouts out so very good interesting woman great listen lee thank you whoever that was martin smith brilliant kaz great lee thanks kaz for coming on that was cool to uh interact with steffi there and she enjoyed it uh, interacting with you there kaz ollie how's it going ollie great friend of mine Back in the day, Ollie, wasn't it? Mid Wilkes and Morden. Really enjoyed them days. Mr. Oliver Nutt. Be good to see you sometime soon, buddy, when we get rid of all this COVID and get to meetings and stuff. I'll have to come and see you and your boy and everything. I see you doing uh, great things as well with the motocross. Father and son continues on, as it were. <laughs> but yes, very inspiring lady. Very, uh, yeah, that's, the, that's a great word, mate. Very inspiring full of energy and passion for the sport. It's lovely to see, isn't it? But yeah, what a, what a woman she is. She certainly uh, inspires us for sure, especially after completely like, talking about losing legs and things like that. And she's pushed on and not having that, that uh, she wasn't going to be able to do anything again. Wow. What a woman. What a rider she was as well. That's for sure. Uh, just a quick catch up with things. Um, on the new uh 221 yamaha 250 bike uh i've only got 41 tickets left on that now so if anyone wants to message me about that that would be great uh also obviously the chad reed full kit as well and this monday the next one i'm doing is uh this monday it'll be 7 30 p.m uk time with uh ex british championship and gp motocross rider nathan shelton a lot of you remember him uh with the <clears throat> race spec honda days and stuff and i remember him at the front of the 125 gps on the old motor vision tapes and all that it was really cool so it'd be good to have a chat with him on monday about his career and then the following thursday i got uh motorcycle ace alan carter uh he won a gp race gp moto as well and obviously he's got his famous brother kevin e. carter from the speedway world as well and alan's uh, now a coach in the motorcycling world and had success on that side of the fence as well and obviously he had a book out that was uh, really really great uh, that everyone had great reviews on and i know he's sold out twice out already and he's going to be putting another batch out which i'm hoping to get one and uh yeah so we'll have to we'll catch up with him with that and we'll have a great chat about that as well and about his career and his brother and their relationship and the parents and this such a crazy all-round story in in in, in all so it'd be, it's very interesting uh ollie yes for sure keep it up pal cheers ollie good to see you on mate appreciate that so yeah i'll be back monday night 7 30 p.m it's all going on i've even got things to sort out myself i've got an operation on tuesday next week so it's going to be all all go <laughs> hopefully i'll be all right and then uh, hopefully be back for thursday for alan carter's uh but it's it's all going on i've got to go and have a covid test before i go for this up and all these sort of things that's going on in the world right now um so that's interesting so i'll leave you guys i will share this out tomorrow but i will leave you guys and my dad saying again uh it's nice to be important but it's important to be nice and uh she'll definitely know about this one steffi when i say uh, ciao bella all and thank you very much for all joining me 
Cheers, guys. Speak to you all soon. Thank you very much. Ciao, Bella. <laughs>